Thank you, Gio, for the introduction, and thanks, Meg, for uh, allowing me to speak today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your day to join us for the uh, webinar today. Um, I just want to say this is a, a topic I just recently uh, started to research, and it's one of those things that the more I research and read about it, the, the further down the rabbit hole I got, and eventually I just had to stop so I could actually put something together to talk about today. But um, I think some of you may be familiar with what we're going to discuss. Um, it's been a fairly hot topic uh, for the past several years. Um, I'll probably raise some eyebrows today, but I think that's okay because I think it's, a, it's an issue that hasn't been fully addressed and we'll get into some of the factors that play into that. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, we'll talk about the problem and how we got here. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about uh, rare earth elements, how they're used, um, why they're so critical uh, to the Department of Defense and, and its mission, and then also talk about some of the challenges in terms of the rare earth element supply and um, some of the, the things that we need to start thinking about uh, for national stockpile um, issues and also for production of defense-related technologies. So. There are 17 rare earth elements, and we'll get into what those are in the next slide. Uh, but they're using a variety of applications. Most importantly, uh, for Department of Defense, weapons, virtually every weapon system, and uh, tank and ship and aircraft that the Department of Defense uses needs a rare earth element uh, component of some kind. And we'll talk a little bit about what those are in a few slides. Uh, renewable energy applications for uh, solar panels, um, for some of the motors and wind turbines and things like that. They're also very critical. And then also electronics. I know many of us have smartphones and we love our laptops, um, but all of that requires electronic components and all of those electronic components require rare earth elements. So they're actually very important to modern day society, um, even beyond defense and uh, related security applications. Um, so the primary challenge is that somewhere in the 1990s, the rare earth supply in the United States started to kind of shift. Uh, there was a lot of mining operations at one point. Most of the processing in the world did occur here in the United States. Then this transition happened and it started to shift to China. And we'll talk about how that happened and why that happened. What's really important to, to understand is that China really holds the monopoly on rare earth mining and processing. So almost all countries in the world are nearly 100% reliant, reliant on China for the rare earth element supply. The United States is about 100% reliant on foreign imports. China is the number one country that we import rare earth elements from, but we also import from South Africa and a few others. Uh, we do have a slide to show you the, the flow of how rare earth elements get here. Um, so what we do right now is we buy them uh, when we need them, basically. Um, through the Department of Defense, the Defense Logistics Agency does authorize the purchase of certain rare earth elements when they're needed. Um, they go into a stockpile and they are kept there and as they're needed for different types of defense systems, you know, they're obviously sold to contractors and um, incorporated into those components. The problem is stockpiles only last so long, um, so we have to go back and con continuously replenish the stockpile. Um, one of the issues is that if China ever decides to stop selling, which has actually happened, and we'll talk about how that happened, but if they stop selling rare earth elements or decide that they're not going to export them anymore, uh, we're going to be in a very difficult position because we won't be able to make anything that I discuss on this page. No weapons, no energy applications, no electronics. So I think all of you can, can see uh, what a really big and terrible, scary issue that would be. Um, so... Some of the reasons why we currently don't really have any rare earth mining or production or processing here is a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, kind of the selling off of assets that occurred in the 1990s into the early 2000s. Some of it also had to do with some regulatory decisions. Um, on the next slide, I'll talk about how the rare earth elements are actually processed and why that might have you know, been affected by unintended consequences of some regulation that happened in the 1990s. Um, and then also a lot of this really has to do with um, Chinese policy. Um, China actually, from the highest levels of government, had made a determination that they were going to be the number one producer of rare earth elements in the world. 
They wanted to basically have something that was comparable to what the Middle East has in terms of oil. And so they made this a state priority and it really paid off. That's, that's kind of the bottom line. Um, there have been a, a number of legislative actions that have tried to address this problem. There have been a number of GAO reports, congressional research reports, uh, duty inspector general even got involved. And even though everybody has been bringing up the issues and the challenges, and we've even had some real world uh, geopolitical challenges with this, it doesn't really seem that DUD is, is taking this in a serious manner. Um, so if anybody's on the phone today from uh, DASD for, uh, you know, I think it's um, the production that, that handles all this and then also um, from Defense Logistics Agency. I'll be more than happy to talk to you some more about this because I think it's really something that, that we need to start thinking about. And another challenge is that even if we started today and we got mining back and processing back and, and research, it's still going to take about 15 years before we get back to the level that we were prior to kind of this Chinese hegemony, if you will. So if you'll go to the next slide, you'll see a diagram of the periodic table. We'll talk about what rare earth elements are. Ironically, rare earth elements really aren't that rare. They're fairly common. Uh, the reason that they're called rare is that when they are found in deposits, there really isn't a high concentration of elements in that deposit. There are certain very few locations around the world where you've got a high enough concentration of rare earth elements uh, to actually be economically feasible. Uh, we do have one mine in the United States, the Mountain Pass Mine in California, uh, that ha has one of those heavy collections of rare earth elements deposits, but that's really about the best one that we have here. China has a number of these, uh, so it, it made a lot of sense for them to you know, and make their multi-million dollar investments into this enterprise. Um, so as you can see, when we actually talk about the rare earth elements, it's a very specific group. Um, it's if you look at the periodic table and you've got the kind of box at the bottom all by itself, it's that very top row, which we call the lanthanide series. Um, and then it's also a couple of elements in the column above lanthanum um, as well. So these are the rare earth elements. Um, we'll talk about what they're actually used for. And we divide them into light and heavy ones. The light ones are in red. These ones are okay. Um, they have some uses, but it's really the ones in yellow. The heavy ones that are the ones that really go into a lot of the more critical components. Um, and we'll talk about what some of those different elements and components are in the next slide. So if you want to go ahead and turn to the next slide, we'll talk about defense applications here. So on the left on this table, you'll see uh, specific applications. And a lot of these are found in guidance and control systems, uh, other electronic systems, uh, motors and things like that in uh, defense applications like missile systems, or they're used in tanks, they're used in guidance systems for fighter jets, things like that. Um, so we have an application, right? And then we have to actually take the rare earth element and turn it into something. So if you look at the third column, we have a list of all the different rare earth elements um, that are used in those specific applications. So for example, God is in control. A lot of those systems rely on these very uh, super heavy magnets. And most of those magnets are made of neodymium. Um, same with um, our smartphones. Uh, there are motors inside of these, or not motors, they're um, small um, magnets that cause like vibrations and help with other functions on the phone. And, and they're, most of those are made of neodymium. So it's a very important component. Um, and then these are some of the systems, the examples on the very last column where these goddess and control systems that rely on magnets are found. So cruise missiles, uh, the newest Navy de destroyer, the Zumwalt. So, and I won't go into any more detail on the rest of this, but you can see a variety of different applications, a variety of different examples, and all these require earth elements. If you go to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about, um, why DOD um, is engaged in using the rare earth elements, why they are you know, concerned about the stockpile, why they need to be more concerned to stockpile. But there's actually legal uh, precedent for DOD being engaged in this. Um, and then these are actually codified in, in the US code. But 
on the left of this column here, we have three different defense agencies um, that are actively engaged in ensuring the uh, supply of critical materials. Um, these go beyond just rare earth elements, but almost all the rare earth elements are considered critical materials for defense. So we've got Defense Logistics Agency, specifically the Strategic Materials Branch. Uh, we also have um, uh, Office of the Deputy Secretary of Defense, DASD, for Manufacturing Industrial Based Policy, and then we have the Strategic Materials Protection Board. So these are uh, just one kind of primary responsibility that each agency has in ensuring uh, the critical element supply is met. Um, there are a number of other responsibilities. And there are some other agencies that actually get engaged as well. Department of Energy, for example, um, also plays a role in ensuring the rare earth element supply. There's a lot of research that they do that is critical uh, to the security of the United States uh, that requires rare earth elements. And we'll talk a little bit about what DOE is doing. This discussion is primarily focused on defense applications, uh, but there is some overlap, and we'll talk about what that is later on. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, you'll see a, a large map, and it has basically the logistics flow of how all of the rare earth elements that the United States use actually gets here. Um, so you can see uh, the majority of our imports come from China. So over 90% of the rare earth elements that we use are uh, directly from China. We get some from Russia, South Africa, um, and I believe from Canada as well. Um, the interesting thing is that there are um, a variety of countries that do produce these. Um, the most of the ones that we engage with, with the exception of China and Russia, are relatively friendly, um, but are probably are definitely our largest importer um, is China, which we've had a fairly lukewarm relationship with recently, and then also Russia, um, another lukewarm relationship with. If you want to go to the next slide, and you'll see a graph, and, and this is actually worth spending some time. We'll talk about the shift of how we got from um, a rather large U.S. production for rare earth elements to this, this Chinese um, hegemony, if you will. So beginning in the 50s, um, rare earth elements were discovered, and interestingly, um, they're actually pretty much a byproduct or almost a waste product from uh, other mining operations. It wasn't until somebody had discovered that uh, one of them, I think it was Europium, actually made uh, the red and the original, uh, the old cathode ray tube television sets, they made the red much redder. So when you add that shift from black and white television to color, that's when the rare earth elements actually started to become important. Um, so when that happened, the United States had a lot of mining operations and people realized that the rare earth elements could be extracted from these waste materials. Um, one of the, the things that really makes this quite interesting is that there's a radioactive element called thorium, which is used as a fuel in, in certain types of reactors, not here in the United States, but at other nations in the world. Um, somewhere, I think in the early 90s or maybe the late 80s, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the International Atomic Energy Association, um, they had changed the way that thorium was to be um, dealt with basically. And, and when those regulations changed, thorium, which is associated with the rare earth elements, you almost always find them together, kind of made all of that mining waste that contain rare earth elements um, basically taboo. So a lot of places in the United States that mined uh, rare earth elements had a thorium nearby, they didn't want to deal with it. So all these operations started to go out of business. When that happened, that was when China began to really have its push towards um, increasing their production. So a lot of this comes from the fact that the United States and other Western nations um, have a greater regard for environmental regulation and policy. China has a little bit more lax view on the issue, so that was one of the major uh, factors in terms of pushing this rare earth element production towards China. So many other things were, um, you know, just basically interest. Um, rare earth elements are pretty cheap to buy right now. So for a lot of places, it was gonna be more expensive to put in all the procedures and things, policies and protocols they would have to put in place if they were gonna mine rare earth elements because of the thorium issue, so it was just easier to buy. So 
Because of that shift, you can see this massive red that increases for China as we get you know, past 1985. Um, one thing I, I want to point out, many of you are familiar with um, some of the Chinese research and development programs, na namely the 863 program and 973 program. And these are advanced research programs that the Chinese state uses um, for military capacity and others. If you'll see um, around 1985 or so um, is when the 863 program began. And you see this massive increase in their birth element production. If you go forward a bit to the next larger bump on the graph, that was when the 973 program um, began um, action. So it's interesting that these two large bumps early on in their kind of climb to being a number one producer of earth elements coincides with um, the initiation of these major research programs. And many of the components that would be used in advanced weaponry would require rare earth elements. So there's definitely a correlation here. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see a Dilbert cartoon. I thought it was uh, kind of appropriate just to take a break with everything that's been going on in the world and enjoy a little humor for a second. But this issue is so bad that, um, you know, beyond just legislation and other uh, federal agencies writing about this, even uh, um, Scott Adams has gotten involved. So I'll give you a second to read that. But basically, uh, Dilbert's saying that it's so bad that we don't have enough rare earth elements that perhaps we could hope will be reincarnated as a Chinese person and will have access to the rare earth element. So you know things are pretty bad when Dilbert gets in on the act. So if you go to the next slide, I want to spend a few minutes here to talk about what I think are the two major problems of our lack of um, a long-term solution to the rare earth element supply. So the first problem is production. We use a lot of rare earth elements, a lot. So any Virginia-class submarine, um, fast attack submarine, requires about 9,200 pounds of rare earth elements. Um, and obviously for security reasons, the specific ones and the amounts aren't, aren't known for the public, but this is just in general, out of those elements that we discussed earlier. Uh, early, early bird class destroyers, about 5,200 pounds, and then the F-35 fighter, 920 pounds. Um, I also actually just heard something I was watching the other day that um, a Toyota Prius uses about 75 pounds of rare earth element. So even beyond defense, we're talking a significant amount of rare earth elements in terms of volume that are used. Um, anytime we want to build any of these things that I have on the screen, plus Tomahawk missiles and other defense systems, anything that DOD uses, um, we basically have to go to China and buy the rare earth elements to put into these, um, these different vehicle. So, you know, kind of something to think about. The more that we produce in terms of the defense industry, the more that we're actually paying China and importing. So uh, quite kind of an interesting arrangement there. And, you know, everything works as long as China continues to sell. But if you want to go to the next page, we'll talk about the second problem. And this is related directly to China's monopoly on the rare earth element supply and how they can actually use this as a geopolitical weapon. So in 2010, there was an incident in the South China Sea where I believe it was a Chinese ship had um, run into a Japanese fishing vessel and things got pretty tense there for a while between the two countries. Um, as a result of that, and this could never be proven, but it became pretty clear that this was the, the intended outcome. Um, as a result of that, the Chinese um, held up their scheduled shipments of rare earth elements to Japan. Now, Japan is the number one importer of rare earth elements in the world, and so they, re they rely very heavily on China for the supply. So because of that, there were a lot of delays in production and manufacturing for a variety of things in Japan that, that require these. Um, in fact, it got so, so bad that the United States got involved as well and filed some um, you know, petitions with the World Trade Organization. But this is just one incident, and, and things, you know, did resolve, but there was definitely a short-term disruption in the supply of earth elements to Japan. So imagine if China ever decided to do something like this, you know, they're under no obligation. There are, sure, there are uh, agreements and international treaties, but 
it doesn't mean you always have to follow them. If China ever decides that they're not going to sell, sell certain rare earth elements to the United States, then that's going to really impede our ability to produce some of these uh, defense and, and weapon systems I discussed earlier. So if you'll go to the next slide, um, I was talking to Gia yesterday and she refers to this as the R slide. So um, I tried to make this pretty catchy so everybody could remember it. But basically, these are the six different things I could do, I think we could do about it. Um, and they just all happen to start with R's. And there's probably one more I could add and that would be regulation. As I mentioned earlier, the thorium issue, I think has really impeded the ability of the United States to mine and process rare earth elements. So that might be something to look at. And then also, um, you know, different regulatory and policy schemes that the Department of Defense can, can start to look at and really be serious about this. Um, there's some legislation that was introduced earlier this year by a Representative Duncan, from Cal or, uh, Duncan Hunter from California. Um, and I had read on a legislative website that kind of gives probabilities to how likely a bill is going to pass, give it a 1% probability that it would actually pass. So, you know, it's still an issue that people are trying to address and it's still an issue that people are, are overlooking. But some of the things I think we need to do is, is basically diversify our strategy. Right now, DOD buys stuff, we put it in a stockpile. Um, when things start to get low, we buy more. That works for right this second, but it's not a long-term sustainable um, path because even if we stockpile stuff, if things go really bad and China stops selling, we can't get imports from anybody else, right? We're gonna be very limited to where we can get elements from. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe Canada might be a good supplier, but even then we're still relying on foreign imports. So um, it isn't really a long-term solution. But what we need to start thinking about is how do we diversify, you know, how we, how we actually get elements that we use in these defense systems. So, you know, it's okay to have some imports, right? I'm not saying that we need to completely have 100% um, mining and production operations here in the United States, but we can't just solely rely on imports, which we are now, we're about 100%. So, you know, having other methods to diversify our portfolio. So looking at recovery, you know, can we begin mining? Can we open up the mountain pass mine again? Uh, can we look at recycling? Uh, all these cell phones and laptops and the things that we use, there's a huge business in recycling the electronic waste. And a lot of that is to get access to these rare earth elements. Unfortunately, the ironic thing here is that a lot of this waste that we produce here in the United States is actually shipped overseas to China and they process it and then they send it back. So even then we're still out of the loop. Um, we can reprocess some of these uh, certain rare earth elements are used as catalyst, you know, in industrial uh, reactions, so reprocessing those, uh, replacing them by using other types of materials. So far, we haven't found any good replacements um, with existing elements, but there are new types of materials being you know developed every day. Some of the new types of nanomaterials and two-dimensional materials, things like carbon nanotubes and graphene, show a lot of good promise with electrical conductivity. So you know it's possible that they could be replacements um, eventually for some of these rare earth elements. Um, it is, I believe, at uh, Ames Laboratory, maybe in conjunction with Iowa State. Uh, there's a research institute that the Department of Energy is funding to actually look at these issues of, you know, reprocessing, recovering, recycling, and trying to find other materials that could do the same job as rare earth elements. So this issue is being looked at in, in other um, areas outside of defense. And then the last two, I think, are kind of the long-term things that we need to address but you know looking at resilience how do we fix this long-term issue um you know i mentioned the first diversifier acquisition strategy but also you know not relying just on the stockpiling method because that's not going to work for very long um, and then finally looking at reestablishing um a rare earth production um industry or sector here in the united states now that's going to take quite some time as i mentioned you know, at the beginning of the presentation, even if we started today, we've got about 15 years worth of, of work that we need to do to get back to a viable, thriving um, industry. But that's gonna require looking at mining and production, processing, refining. How do we get all those um, different locations up and running? How do we get the manpower to, um, to run those things? How do we get training for those programs? So 
also getting a rare earth research program up and running, uh, having you know, faculty and professors at universities that can actually teach people how to work with rare earth elements. Uh, they have a very interesting chemistry. Not everybody understands um, exactly how they work. It's a very specific skill set within chemistry, looking at lanthanide chemistry. So how do we make sure that we've got enough people who understand, you know, kind of the unique situation that rare earth elements have so we can actually work with them and make things out of them. And then finally, how do we get these educational programs up? Right now, the only uh, secondary educational program uh, looking at rare earth elements is in Iowa State. And, you know, that's okay for right this second, but if we're going to reestablish a presence here in the United States in terms of rare earth elements and that, that supply and logistics chain, then how do we start implementing these different programs, getting the right people who can teach them, um, recruiting students, and so forth? So if you go to the next slide, I just want to talk briefly about uh, the services of HDIAC. And then we'll, we'll take uh, some time here to answer some questions and hopefully we'll, we'll have a good discussion today. Um, but just to remind some of you who may have heard this before for others, just to let you know, we offer a technical inquiry service. We can provide up to four free hours of information gathering services. Um, so if I piqued your curiosity today, if I really got you thinking, you want to learn more about rare earth elements, what the UD is doing, uh, what you can do with them, what some of the other issues are, this would be a good way for us to find some information for you. Uh, we can do literature searches, uh, document requests. We can also write very brief, um, you know, technical solutions to a question that you may have. As long as it fits within our eight focus areas, specifically rare earths would fit into critical infrastructure protection, uh, we can answer any questions that you have. Another service we offer is um, what we call our core analysis task. This is a uh, pre-computer, pre-awarded contract vehicle. Uh, we can begin work in as little as six to eight weeks. A couple caveats, um, projects have a cap of $500,000 and they must be completed in 12 months. So now that it looks like we may have a budget here that'll be good through the end of September, uh, might be a good time. If you have any questions here, want to start answering some of these questions, we can certainly help you with your, your research. If you'll go to the last slide, um, that's just my contact information. Feel free to contact me directly. Um, like I said, we'll take questions here, hopefully and have a really good discussion. Um, but if there's anything else you want to talk about or if you didn't get a chance to ask your question today, just feel free to email or call me anytime.